what made to you so special? Nothing. I'm just a kid from Brooklyn. Okay, guys, Frank Stout, just a guy from Brooklyn, with the release of Deadpool and Wolverine, we now have 34 movies in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I want to rank them all so you guys can see where everything fits, especially Deadpool and Wolverine, which is brand new. I grew up in the 70s reading and collecting Marvel comics, so I do know a lot of the source material. Although I'm a huge fan, I am highly critical of the MCU. But don't get it twisted. I never want them to fail. I am not a hater. I love these movies. Let's get to these movies. But first, quickly, my two rules. Rule number one is spoilers. With the exception of Deadpool and Wolverine, I plan on spoiling everything. So please, hard spoiler warning. Don't say I didn't warn you. Rule number two is, as always, this is a favorites list not a best list. And the best way that you can converse with me about my list is to show me yours in the comments section. Kicking things off at number 34 is Spider-Man Far From Home. I am not buying any of the bread that this movie is selling. It's funny as a teen comedy, Jake Killenthal plays a great Mysterio whose special effects look fantastic. Unfortunately, the entire premise is preposterous, with Tony Stark leaving a pair of powerful glasses to a teenage boy, and once again, we get a villain who's butthurt at Tony Stark. I've lost count. I was also hoping to finally seeing a solo Spider-Man movie where he isn't Iron Man's bitch. Tony Stark is dead in this movie, for Christ's sake. Coming in at number 33 is Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantum Mania. I don't know how many fans want to spend an entire movie in the quantum realm. All I know is I wasn't asking for this. The movie has so much green screen, it feels like a spy kids movie. They recast Cassie Lang with an actress I find incredibly annoying, and her character is written to be completely unlikable. She might be the biggest villain in the movie. Speaking of villains, they introduce Modoc who's literally a total joke and looks like something out of a Snapchat filter. Bill Murray is here for a minute or two, literally for just a joke. And it's not even that funny. And finally, we get Kang the Conqueror, the new Thanos-level baddie for the MCU. But as everybody knows, those plans have been scrapped. Jonathan Majors does a fantastic job portraying Kang, on the other hand, he's easily defeated, no one dies, and everybody escapes the quantum realm, which makes this movie completely meaningless. Coming in at number 32 is The Marvels. Mon Vellani as Miss Marvel is the only thing saving this mess from being dead last. The only thing worse than an MCU movie relying too much on comedy is an MCU movie relying too much on comedy that isn't funny. Got a villain so forgettable that I'm not even going to bother to remember her name. At one point, they travel to a planet where everyone communicates in song. Yeah, that's a real knee slapper. Remember the whole alien cat flirking gag from the first Captain Marvel? This time, there's a whole bunch of them because that's going to make the same joke funnier, no? And Sam Jackson's Nick Fury is back, fresh off the maybe it shouldn't be canon secret invasion, which I guess he agrees with me because he's acting like it never happened. Coming in at number 31 is Thor The Dark World. It has some positives, it spends more time in Asgard, it introduces an Infinity Stone, and it's very Loki-centric, displaying just how much of a wild card he can be. There's also some good banter between Loki and Thor and a few others. The comedy is extremely hit or miss with Jane trying to date someone on account that Thor's been gone for too long. Selvig loses his mind as he tries out for a spot on Magic Mike. 
The movie's biggest shortcomings is introducing another forgettable villain in Malekith the Dark Elf. He's evil and wants to cover the world in darkness because he's evil. Now that's deep. Coming in at number 30 is Thor Love and Thunder. Its previous entry, Thor Ragnarok, was really towing the line by having a ton of comedy. So what does Taika Waititi do? Another player and There's the line! And you just lost it! After years and many movies where the Thor character has grown, he becomes a complete punchline. This is pretty much a parody film. Van Damme splits, shrieking goats, and a love triangle between Thor and his two hammers. Christian Bale is totally wasted. Shame on you, Kevin Feige, for letting that happen. They give the same treatment to acting legend Russell Crowe, making him a total joke. But wait, there's the biggest joke of all, cancer. Once again, I am not buying any of the bread this movie is selling. Coming in at number 29 is Doctor Strange. Benedict Cumberbatch is perfect casting, and I'm very high on the character. Watching him go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Thanos in Infinity War shows just how powerful and cool he can be. But this origin story gives me too much of that haven't I been here before feeling. The cocky genius who gets knocked down a peg or two, acquires power, and his whole outlook has changed. This is just too similar to Iron Man for me. But hey, that is his origin story. The Inception-like visuals are trippy and reminiscent of the old Doctor Strange comics. I'd love to see this movie enhanced, if you know what I mean. Break out Billy Bone Thor. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all in all, it's a solid movie that gives you the stranger side of Marvel, pun intended. Coming in at number 28 is Iron Man 3. As a Tony Stark movie, it's pretty fun. But as an Iron Man movie, it's got some problems. The big one is Tony's new suit, which doesn't work off his arc reactor, which is kind of the point of having an arc reactor, right? Instead, we all wait around while the suit is recharging on our car battery. Really? For you hardcore comics fans, I was never pissed about what is now known as the Mandarin Twist, which sounds like something you order at the bar of a P.F. Chang's. Watching Ben Kingsley stink up the bathroom and doze off mid-conversation was hilarious. With the suit out of play, we get some really fun Tony Stark moments. I don't want to make things awkward for no. you, but I do you have to good. show you. Boom! Uh, Hispanic Scott Bale. <laughs> I'm sorry, is that me? Yeah. It's, I mean, I had them do it off a doll that I made, so it's not like it's off a picture. Watching him take out a security detail with some stuff he picked up at your local Home Depot shows the world that the man is so much more than the suit. But at the end of the day, I wanted an Iron Man movie, and I feel I was sold a cheap bill of goods. Coming in at number 27 is Captain Marvel. I thought we were getting the Bourne identity in space, but instead we got a very snarky hero that some people just didn't like. Is that like a personal attack or something? The de-aging of Samuel Jackson just hasn't aged well. I'm here all week, folks. To be frank, and not just because that's my name, Secret Invasion and the Marvels are so bad, they make this movie worse than what it really is. The 90s setting was basically Blockbuster, Radio Shack, and a few songs that didn't always work with the scenes associated with them. The woman's empowerment stuff wasn't a problem for me. I just wish it was better developed instead of just showing a montage of flashback scenes of Carol when she was younger. Ben Mendelsohn didn't have a lot to work with, but I thought he stole every scene. I'm a fan. Coming in at number 26 is Black Widow. The MCU Russian spy film about a character that recently died is pretty fun and a little bittersweet. Obviously, the timing could have been better. David Harbour hams it up as Alexei, aka Red Guardian, kind of like the Captain America of Russia. And Florence Pugh comes in to be the new Black Widow for the future. The whole staged family in America aspect really works here. Ugh, but Black Widow has no superpowers, and yet she takes hits and falls off buildings, walking away without a scratch. And then they totally drop the ball with Taskmaster, a terrific anti-hero in the comics, with the stupidest twist 
perhaps in the entire franchise. And of course, the Marvel formula rears its ugly head with a fortress in the sky that isn't necessary. It's supposed to be a spy film for Christ's sake. Coming in at number 25 is Captain America, the first Avenger. I absolutely love the first half. It's Cap's origin story, and it's perfect. It also has some nice Easter eggs with an Indiana Jones reference. The original Human Torch is displayed at the Stark Expo, and Game of Thrones' Natalie Dormer putting the moves on Cap. But I do think they could have done better with all that World War II stuff. Instead, they just show it as a quick montage, especially with the Howling Commandos from the comics. There are fans. Hugo Weaving was great as the Red Skull. Basically the Joker to his Batman, just like Bucky is the Robin if you didn't know. So why waste Red Skull with just one movie by sending him into space? Coming in at number 24 is Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. The MCU's first martial arts extravaganza. Unless you count Netflix's Iron Fist, but let's not, right? I enjoyed the action, the comedy, and the story. But just like Black Widow, the MCU goes big when it really doesn't have to. You have a perfect ending setup with Father Against Son. Why are there shadow demons, dragons, and other mythical characters in this big, ridiculous CGI battle? We want Marvel's version of Enter the Dragon, not Fantastic Beasts and where to find them. Coming in at number 23 is The Eternals. A guy with super strength flies and shoots heat vision beams out of his eyes. A female goddess warrior, a speedster, you get the picture, right? But no, this isn't the MCU version of the Justice League. Actually, these characters are based on mythology that most comic book superheroes come from. I enjoy it a little bit more because of how different it is. And its true flaw is it's a team with 10 members, with the story that dates back beyond comprehension. And I think that's just too much of a burden for one movie. A TV series might have been the better route to go. It also goes very weird with the Earth being an egg supposed to hatch a celestial. A celestial like a god? Small G, son. Unfortunately, this movie just wasn't well received, and I doubt we're going to see any of these characters anytime soon. Coming in at number 22 is Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Definitely the weakest of the Guardians trilogy, but not a bad movie. James Gunn was given more wiggle room, so it's a tad bit darker with a lot of Gunn's dark humor. Mantis is a great addition and she fits right in. Her empathic powers provide a lot of fun comedy. You feel love? Yeah, I guess, yeah, I feel a general unselfish love for just about no. everybody. No. Romantic, sexual love. No, no I don't. For her. No, that is not. <laughs> Kurt Russell is a fun space villain in Ego the Living Planet. And his manipulation of Quill makes complete sense. It was working. Right up until the moment he tells him that he gave his mother cancer and killed her. Who's not going to act accordingly? That's just lazy writing right there. This soundtrack, which is kind of Guardian's thing, wasn't as solid. Although I love Fleetwood Mac's The Chain. That's my jam. And Yandu's sacrifice felt a little unearned and forced. But I must admit, it had me feeling a little something there. Coming in at number 21 is Iron Man 2. Yes, this movie has too much going on. Ivan Vanko, Justin Hammer, the government wants Tony's suits, Terrence Howard all of a sudden looks like Don Cheadle, Tony's arc reactor is slowly killing him, War Machine, Black Widow, and setting up the Avengers. On top of all that, the movie doesn't have a lot of action outside of the end battle. I really love Robert Downey Jr.'s performance. All of the fascinating stuff with him and his father and coming up with a new core for his arc reactor. I eat all that shit up. Coming in at number 20 is The Incredible Hulk. As much as I understand that Edward Norton needed to be replaced, he was the better Bruce Banner. Anyone who's read the comics knows he actually looks like Bruce Banner. And this solo Hulk film isn't just underrated. 
it's before its time. Unlike so many MCU projects that sport too much comedy, this has a really nice balance. It's got great Easter eggs, like the theme song from the old TV show, and Lou Ferrigno even makes a cameo appearance. My only negative is some crappy CGI of that era. The movie also does a nice job of setting up not just one, but two big Hulk villains. One is being utilized, and the other, well, maybe one day. Coming in at number 19 is Spider-Man Homecoming. Oh lord, thank god we didn't get another origin story, cause that's just been done to death. Instead, we get a John Hughes-esque teen comedy with a twist I didn't see coming. Michael Keaton is perfect as the vulture who's not motivated by world domination or even revenge. He's just trying to make some cash to feed his family because he feels like he's been screwed by the system. Sad to say, the Spider-Man vulture fights were the weakest aspects of the movie. I'm gonna keep saying this. I don't know if it's Marvel Studios' arrogance or them not wanting a Sony IP to outshine all their shiny toys, but making Spider-Man Iron Man's bitch will never sit right with me. Luckily, the fans know the truth. Spider-Man is Marvel. <laughs> Coming in at number 18 is Thor, probably the hardest story to convert from comics to film, especially because Iron Man and Hulk are so grounded and scientific. But I think they pulled it off nicely with the alien space god with a little g being cast out to Earth and stripped of all his power in a very Shakespearean plot mixed with a fish out of water comedy. Although we don't get a lot of Asgard, I do love the look they've established, especially the armor that Odin, Thor, and Loki all sport. I think it hasn't been topped since. Can we all agree that bleaching Chris Helmsworth's eyebrows was really stupid? In just one movie, Thor goes through real growth as a character. It all feels organic and earned, which is why Love and Thunder is such a stain in the underpants that is Thor's journey through the MCU. Coming in at number 17 is Ant-Man and the Wasp. While the original Ant-Man was a heist movie, this is more of a race against time to rescue Janet Van Dyne, the original Wasp, from the quantum realm. Multiple organizations are trying to acquire the MacGuffin known as Hank Pym's Shrinking Tech, which is stored in a huge building that whenever I see it shrink, I immediately think, What is this? A center for ants! Lawrence Fishburne, Walton Goggins, and Hannah John Kamen add to an already impressive cast. I also fully admit that these movies are very low in stakes, and yet they're perfect to squeeze in through all the world-level threats we see in the MCU. Coming in at number 16 is Avengers Age of Ultron. The weakest of the Avengers movies has moved up a few spots after the release of Endgame, which makes everything go full circle. It's circular. It's like a carousel. You pay the quarter, you get on the horse. It goes up and down and around. Uh, circular, circle, with the music, the flow, all good things. It went bigger and longer than the original Avengers, but bigger doesn't necessarily mean better. Love the addition of the Maximoff twins, which unfortunately couldn't be connected to the X-Men or even labeled mutants. But they worked all the same. The snarky James Spader playing Ultron was okay, but the villain wasn't portrayed as very intimidating. There's also some humor sprinkled out that was really corny. Romanoff, you and Banner better not be playing hide the zucchini. Ugh, whoever thought of making Banner and Black Widow a thing, come on, man. Coming in at number 15 is Wakanda Forever. It's a miracle that this movie even exists after losing Chadwick Boseman and production problems continuing to mount thanks to the pandemic. Fans were screaming and protesting that Black Panther not be recasted. But Marvel Studios handled each situation as it arise and produced a solid movie. Introducing Namor as the villain slash anti-hero is probably the main reason. He's not only Marvel's version of Aquaman, he 
he actually shares the honor of being Marvel's first superhero with the original Human Torch in 1939. I don't know how to put this, but I'm kind of a big deal. Really? The movie does a great job of honoring Bozeman and uses his vacancy from the throne, creating an almost Game of Thrones scenario with different countries conspiring to obtain Wakanda's vibranium, which happens to be a problem for Namor's people who have been in hiding. The addition of Ironheart just didn't work for me, and the suit looked too anime for my taste. Coming in at number 14 is Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. A slightly misleading title. Yes, the multiverse is there, and Strange and America Vasquez navigate through it, trying to save her from now fully-fledged villain Wanda, the Scarlet Witch. And the movie does a good job of explaining her reasonings. Having the Illuminati there was a nice touch. Yeah, it's fan service, but I'm a fan and I like to be serviced. But having Wanda go all Dark Phoenix on everyone was the highlight of the film for me. Sam Raimi throws in as much of his signature horror style as Disney would permit. Disney just can't help themselves sometimes. I'm a Raimi fan, so I'm a little biased. I will always dream of an R-rated horror version with Wanda covered in blood instead of, what was that, motor oil? Coming in at number 13 is Iron Man. The make-or-break movie that started it all is still one of its best entries, as Robert Downey Jr. is perfect casting, even if he wasn't the first choice. He made the role his own, probably channeling some of his inner demons, and now I just can't see anyone else in the role. Yes, Tom Cruise, even you. To understand just how much of a gamble it was, Mr. 1 times 1 equals 2, Terrence Howard, got top billing, and that's just keeping it real. You add Jeff Bridges and Gwyneth Paltrow to that mix, and the deck looks stacked. Seeing the Mark I come out of that cave was special, as I can remember reading that specific comic. The movie's simple, it's grounded, and it's more character-driven. It also rocks in that old-school rock and metal way. Coming in at number 12 is Ant-Man. Paul Rudd's comedic style just works for me. You add Michael Douglas, Michael Pena, Evangeline Lilly, and T.I., and you're gonna have a fun MCU heist movie. The divorced father wanting to be in his daughter's life is why this little comedy sits so high on this list. I saw a lot of myself there wanting to spend all my free time with my daughter, Caitlin. That being said, Ant-Man is actually an important and powerful character in the comics. In Marvel Comics, he's a founding member of the Avengers even before Captain America joined. And it was Hank Pym who built Ultron, not Tony Stark. This movie was in development hell for years, going through constant changes, but in the end it really works and it's got no business being this good. Coming in at 11 is Black Panther. Oh lord, this movie made a lot of money at the box office. And it comes pretty close to being perfect. The characters, the world building, the multiple villains, and their motivations. Michael B. Jordan gives us one of the MCU's best villains as the complex yet damaged Killmonger. Despite his eventual downfall, he has a lasting effect on T'Challa who goes against his kingdom's traditions of staying hidden from the outside world. Andy Serkis as Claw was like a guilty pleasure character with his over-the-top antics. The movie is downright stunning with vibrant colors, something that the MCU is not known to do. They usually use some sort of washed-out filter with their movies to kind of downplay the colors. But if you look at scenes like the waterfall scene, those colors really pop. The movie almost blows the landing with some spotty CGI battles in the final act. If you can't make a CGI rhino look like a real rhino, leave it out, buddy. Coming in at number 10 is Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. James Gunn is brought back to finish his trilogy. Could it have been better? Sure. 
Did it focus heavily on cute animals that were being experimented on? Obviously. Did it have a new interesting villain far different from all the others in the MCU? Absolutely. I really love the direction that Star-Lord and Gamora go through, as it's clear this isn't the same Gamora from the first two movies. We finally get the introduction of Adam Warlock, but it feels too little too late, and making him a clueless man-child is a little disrespectful to the source material. But this movie is all about Rocket. You're definitely going to get answers, and some of them are kind of rough. But any negatives I've mentioned here are hugely overshadowed by the positives, and I'm happy Gunn was able to finish what he started. Coming in at number 9 is Thor Ragnarok. Thor's best movie is clearly heavy on the comedy. And the thing about comedy is most jokes don't stay funny after multiple watches. This is not the case here for me. There's a story that Thor tells Banner about Loki tricking him by transforming into a snake that makes me crack up every single time. Which leads me to my biggest positive. I have a man crush on Jeff Goldblum. I truly believe you add him to any film and that film's rating goes up by two stars. Just to be deactivated and the slaves have armed themselves. Oh, I, I don't like that word. Which mainframe? No. Why would I not like mainframe? No, the uh, yes word. Yes word. Sorry, the prisoners with jobs have armed themselves. Okay, that's better. That's better. Kate Blanchett outdoes herself as Hella. She's both terrifying and hilarious when she feels the need. But with this epic funny adventure comes a price. Thor lost his father and most of his companions. But because it's so heavy on the comedy, the drama and the emotion are missing. Coming in at number 8 is the new entry, Deadpool and Wolverine. Deadpool doesn't just get to play in the MCU sandbox. He plays in multiple multiverses in a very fun and entertaining bromance comedy that's less No Way Home and more love letter to the Fox Marvel movie franchise. It's the first MCU movie with real rated R content, full of blood, gore, and enough curse words to piss off your grandparents. This movie has epic fan service cameo porn that made me smile ear to ear. And Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman have great chemistry together. There's a scene where Deadpool goes on a job interview that I absolutely hate. Cable, Domino, and Fire Fist are all missing. Vanessa broke up with him because, why? The story is laughable, but the comedy and action make up for it in droves. The soundtrack is also a huge plus. For all my huge spoiler-filled thoughts, check out my recent video. Coming in at number 7 is Marvel's The Avengers. For so many reasons, this movie shouldn't work, and yet for those same reasons, it not only works, it's so much bigger than the sum of its parts. First off is the mini battles between combatants. You get Cap versus Loki, Iron Man versus Loki, Iron Man versus Thor, Thor versus Hulk, Hulk versus Shield, and so on and so forth. Then there's the banter between all these characters. Big man in a suit of armor. Take that away, what are you? Billionaire playboy philanthropist. <laughs> You add that great epic score, the battle in New York with Hulk being the standout, and you've got your perfect storm. My one lone negative, Cap's costume. I think it looks ridiculous, and as far as I'm concerned, that is not America's ass. Coming in at number six is Captain America Civil War. This movie introduces Black Panther and Spider-Man, and that alone will get you a top 10 status. You add one of the greatest superhero team battles at a German airport and a villain so clever that he single-handedly destroyed the Avengers without any superpowers other than being able to dominate the dance floor. But the real power here is giving an Avengers level movie while still keeping it a Captain America movie. And I find it fascinating 
that both Captain America and Iron Man have come full circle. As Cap is all about serving your country, while Stark was all about don't trust the government. And now, not only did they switch beliefs, they're ready to duke it out. Coming in at number five is Guardians of the Galaxy. Growing up collecting comics, I barely knew who the Guardians of the Galaxy were. But after watching the trailer, I was all in. And it was one of the best theater experiences I ever had. A space pirate, an assassin, a raccoon, a tree creature, and a muscular criminal who takes everything literally are forced to work together to prevent a Kree extremist from obtaining a powerful Infinity Stone. It showed the more outer space side of the MCU, and you enjoy getting to know these characters who listen to really old, catchy songs. I think it's special, and the ending hits me even harder now that my mother passed away in 2019. Coming in at number four is Captain America, the Winter Soldier. Cap had already gone through a few changes since his first movie, but this feels almost like a fresh reboot as the opening is fast-paced and action-packed. Cap has a stealthier, darker uniform, and he moves and fights like a martial artist who's been dabbling in parkour on the weekends. The movie is more espionage political thriller, and it's that unique quality that makes it stand out from the rest. Nick Fury has been assassinated by a super soldier known as the Winter Soldier, and before he dies, he tells Cap to trust no one. Next thing you know, Cap and Black Widow are on the run, and they must go down memory lane to piece everything together before Hydra executes its master plan. It introduces Falcon, sets up civil war, and changes the playing field going forward. If you can find a flaw in this movie, let me know in the comments section, because I can't. Coming in at number three is Spider-Man No Way Home. I'll be the first to admit the first 15 to 20 minutes are pretty bad. But once Doc Ock shows up on that highway, we're off to the races and the thrills don't stop. And yeah, there's a ton of fan service, especially if you're a fan of the older Sony Spider-Man movies. But all these characters are not just here for cameos. They're all interacting and have roles to play. But even bigger is the fact that all three of these MCU Spider-Man movies turn out to be one big origin story. I'm not sure if that was by design or just whimsically thought up last minute. And I'm still annoyed by all the Iron Man stuff. But this is his story, which is vastly different from the other two Spider-Men. Watching Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire come out of those portals made audiences lose their minds. And seeing all three Spider-Men swinging from the Statue of Liberty still gives me chills. Coming in at number two, my runner-up is Avengers Infinity War. Ever since we saw Thanos in that original Avengers end credit scene, fans were waiting for this. If you read the original Infinity Gauntlet storyline, you knew what was coming, but you also knew it had to be something different. The comics version was larger in scale, and the gauntlet made the wearer basically God with a big G. So they scaled back everything and gave Thanos a better motivation. Make no bones about it, this is his movie. A lot of it is told through his point of view. And the Russo brothers knew, in order to include everyone, they'd have to exclude a few for the direct sequel and split the rest into groups. Genius. Absolute genius. But is the movie perfect? Once again, it comes close. This movie does Hulk dirty. I can forgive the fact that Thanos dispatched him in seconds to show how much of a threat he is at the beginning of the movie, especially if he gets a rematch down the road. But what do we get? Banner not being able to get it up for the rest of the movie. You had Mark Ruffalo whining and slapping himself, which really wasn't funny, just completely embarrassing and pathetic. But Banner needing oysters, Viagra, and some horny goat weed aside, the movie is epic. Thor arriving to the battle wielding Stormbreaker is the highlight to be sure. 
But this movie is groundbreaking for another reason. The villain actually wins. I can still remember the loud gasps throughout the theater. I knew it was coming to an extent, but you just get caught up in the moment. And my number one MCU movie is Avengers Endgame. The culmination of 10 plus years of movie storytelling lands the plane with just a few bumps along the ride. The first act is the aftermath of Infinity War's The Snap, which eliminated half of the universe's population. The second act is a trip down Mary Lane with time travel, reminiscent of Back to the Future 2. And the third act is the ultimate final battle, which for the most part is the reason for the movie's top placement. Is this movie perfect? Far from it. You've got Professor Hulk, the fat Thor gag which goes on for way too long, and Captain Marvel's haircut which is the stuff of nightmares. But the movie has such huge moments and brings closure to so many storylines it can be forgiven for such errors. Watching the trinity of Iron Man, Thor, and Cap go toe to toe with Thanos was totally incredible. Watching Fat Thor level up with his beard, sporting Viking braids, and lightning coursing through his body was pretty epic as well. Captain America holding Mjolnir and fighting Thanos possessing Thor-like power made geeks clean their pants and people lost their shit in the theater. And having all of the dusted heroes return through portals to turn the tide is what it's all about. Tony Stark's sacrifice saying I am Iron Man brings everything full circle and with Steve deciding to stay in the past you have closure to all this great storytelling. Well guys that about does it. I hope you enjoyed my ranking. I really hope I get to see yours from the city that never sleeps from the BK. See my face in Peace baby. Right. So my name on my found down on Broadway. Seems I got a pocket full of dreams, baby, I'm from New York.